So we are very happy to have Stefano uh, who will be coming to the Institute as a new postdoc. I think he has some collaboration with Seth or uh, Olga also should be here. Okay. So he's going to tell about new developments in cosmology. Right, thanks for being here. This is a very wide title, but uh, actually because uh, the topics that I covered uh, cannot be resumed in one single title. The main uh, actors will be the cosmic microwave background and the stellar neutrino, but there will be also something about the inflation in the third part and uh, on uh, a new scenario with coupling that energy. So let's start from a quick introduction on uh, cosmic microwave background. This is the spectrum uh, that was released uh, one year ago by Planck. And, uh, the red curve is uh, sorry. The red curve is the, the fit to the, the points. Indeed, it's in perfect agreement. Uh, apart from this uh, small region here, we, there is a dip in the spectrum, and this is the only signal from the CMB alone that uh, there is something beyond the standard model. Uh, I will uh, work also with the polarization data. This uh, the the cross correlation and the pure. Uh, E mode polarization uh, by Planck. How significant is that dip? Uh, it's about uh, two sigma or something uh, like this. Uh, the interesting point is that uh, if uh, the red curve here is the fit to the data, the red curves here are not the fit to this data, but are the fit to the, the temperature data. So the agreement is very, very strong. Uh, the standard model is the lambda CDM model that is uh, well known. The name comes from dark matter, that is 27% uh, of the energy density of our universe, and dark energy that is 68% uh, more or less. This model can be described by six parameters, uh, and uh, from these six parameters uh, it's possible to derive, uh, for example, the Hubble parameter, the matter fluctuations at the smallest case, but it's, it's also possible to study several other quantities, such as neutrino masses or similar. Uh, I want to highlight uh, these two parameters because uh, they are uh, uh, the characters of uh, one of, of two of the, the tensions that appear between the cosmological and the local uh, universe. So, uh, we'll start from the Hubble parameter. Here in blue there are three measurements of the Hubble parameter that are determined uh, using the supernova and cephades in the local universe, so small redshift measurements. Uh, the red points are the lambda CDM predictions obtained uh, with the fit uh, to, the, to the CMB data, both for WMAP and the Planck uh, data. And it's possible to see that uh, there is a tension it's a uh, tension with the most recent uh, determinations, it's uh, about 3 sigma tension. But uh, we must say that uh, the local measurement can be affected by some uh, systematics, while the, the CMB estimates uh, suffer model dependency. And for example, here I plot uh, the points obtained in, in three extensions of the standard uh, lambda CDM model. Uh, it's possible to say that, okay, but uh, CMB is not good in constraining a late time evolution, for example, of dark energy. So if you include also uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations, uh, you get that uh, the estimates are much more closer to the, the lambda CDM predictions. In any case, the error bars uh, depend on the specific model and the tension may be released. So uh, studying extensions of the lambda CDM model has just uh, one of, on one of the possible uh, ways to, to see that an extension is better than the standard uh, model <laughs> is to study if, uh, whether this compatibility between uh, the CMB estimates and the local uh, measurements uh, improves. Another uh, tension appears for the matter fluctuations uh, at the small scales. And for example, the, the fact that uh, the observed universe has uh, less structures at the small scales with respect to those that are predicted can be enclosed in the measurement of this uh, sigma 8 parameter and uh, here we have the 
local measurements uh, using different methods and here we have the, the estimates from cosmology. And again, there is a sigma, two sigma, three sigma tension that, however, must uh, be treated with uh, some uh, care because uh, the calculations are uh, in uh, fully nonlinear regime, so we maybe do not know very well uh, the nonlinear evolution. And then uh, maybe these uh, kinds of measures are affected by strong uh, systematics. If one takes into account everything, uh, the tension seems to disappear. However, it must be confirmed, so future experiments will tell us if effectively there is a tension or not. Okay, just for a moment we leave cosmology and we go to the neutrinos. Maybe there is no need to introduce here the neutrino oscillations, uh, but uh, I want just to say that we have uh, a mixing between the three flare or eigenstates and the three mass eigenstates through the mixing matrix uh, that is called the Ponte Corvo Maki Nakagawa Sakata matrix. This is described by three angles uh, and one possible uh, CP violating phase. And the mixing paradigm includes uh, two square mass differences. However, this paradigm is not, uh, not working very well on explaining all the measurements. And uh, for example, we have anomalies in the short baseline experiments. <coughs> Here uh, I report quickly the, the types of uh, experiments that gives the anomaly. And the first one was the LSD experiment that uh, was uh, 2001 or so, observing uh, excess of antineutrino, electron antineutrino events. But then also the reactor and the gallium uh, classes of experiments observed the disappearance of uh, neutrinos or antineutrinos. All these uh, anomalies can be explained if one assumes that the third mass, uh, squared mass difference is of around one electron volt squared. So this means that if you have three squared mass difference, uh, you must have at least four mass eigenstates. Uh, we call the three active mass eigenstates that are lightest than the sterile eigenstates. That is called sterile because it is not coupled to the standard model bosons. So the mixing paradigm is updated. We have here four mass eigenstates and four flavor eigenstates. And uh, it's actually not correct to say that the sterile uh, neutrino has a mass because it's a flavor against state and not a mass against state. But the mixing with the, the active neutrinos is small. So basically, the, the fourth neutrino has, uh, uh, has equal mass to the sterile neutrino. And I will uh, say MS talking about the fourth mass against state. And one additional neutrino means that you have. Uh, additional effects in cosmology and they must be parameterized in some way. First way to parameterize the sterile neutrino when it was relativistic is to write the radiation energy density using the N effective parameter. N effective should be equal to 3 for the active neutrinos and one single family of additional neutrinos, if it is thermalized through the oscillations in the early universe, provides an additional contribution of one. So with four neutrinos, we would expect an effective equal to four. The, the actual contribution depends on the momentum distribution function of the sterile neutrino. When it becomes non-relativistic, the energy density must be calculated with the new formula that uh, includes the mass. It's uh, more convenient instead of using uh, omega to use the effective mass, uh, because uh, in this case, uh, if the thermalization between the sterile and the active neutrinos is, compl is complete, the effective mass is equal to the physical mass. But also, this depends on the momentum distribution function. So, uh, this uh, function depends on the mechanisms that uh, produce the sterile neutrino. And if the sterile neutrino is produced some, through some thermal mechanism, we have a function of this kind, and we find that the relation between the effective mass and the physical mass and the effective number is this one. But uh, since we don't know how the oscillations uh, behave in the early universe uh, in the hot plasma, 
it's also possible that some non-thermal production mechanism uh, occurs. So, in this guy, in this case, the, the distribution functions is slightly different, and also the relation between the three relevant quantities is. Uh, if we include uh, one additional uh, neutrino that is relativistic in the real universe, uh, we have effects. So, first effect is that uh, the radiation energy density having a contribution of an effective is higher. If this is higher, also the Hubble parameter, so the expansion rate at the time is higher. In this case, uh, the influence, it influences uh, the effective number uh, as an influence on the big bang nuclear synthesis that can be used to constrain the effective number to something like 0.2 from the sterile neutrino that is much uh, smaller than the expected value of 1, for example. And the other effect is on the matter radiation equality that uh, in turn affects uh, the CMB. Uh, CMB, this is just uh, an example of the CMB spectrum. <coughs> and I want now to show what it happens if we increase the amount of radiation. So, increase uh, the amount of radiation, it means that uh, the redshift of equality is shifted and the expansion rate at the CMB decoupling is higher. This has an effect uh, that uh, alters the amplitude and the position of the peaks. But since uh, the position of the peaks is very well measured by the, the CMB experiments, we don't want to alter this uh, angular scale. And so it's convenient to increase also the, effective, the, the matter energy density in order to fix uh, the redshift of equality to the initial value. In this case, however, there is a change in the late time evolution that has minor consequences on the spectrum, but also these consequences must be avoided. And if we increase also the uh, energy density of dark energy, we have that uh, the redshift of matter radiation and of uh, dark matter dark energy qualities are conserved. But uh, the, spect the original spectrum is not conserved because uh, the expansion rate of the universe is uh, higher at all times. And this is an effect uh, as an effect of uh, decreasing the, the fluctuations at the small scales. And I will use this fact to, to show you the, some results later. But that is non-linear stuff again. Uh, no, well actually the, the point is that the non-linear stuff appears if you consider matter perturbations. But uh, CMB is almost uh, everything is linear. Um, if we consider uh, matter perturbation instead, uh, we discover that the main effect of the sterile neutrino is the free streaming effect. Being relativistic in the universe, uh, its velocity is equal to c, but then uh, after uh, the non-relativistic transitions, the velocity of the neutrino diminishes. So there is uh, a maximum in the co-moving free streaming length that uh, of course, uh, that's a specific wave number. It's possible to see here that uh, up above this uh, wave number, all the perturbations are suppressed. If you compare a model where you have only cold dark matter or, or a model with the total amount of matter is the same, but you change a part of the cold dark matter with the hot dark matter. In this case, you obtain a suppression of the power spectrum at the small scales for the matter perturbations. And this is why the sterile neutrino may help in uh, reducing the fluctuations at the small scales and reconciling the cosmological uh, models with the local estimates. Uh, the actual constraints I want to show here are obtained with the old uh, Planck data from 2013, but uh, they are almost uh, qualitatively the same as the, the newest one. So uh, I plot here the constraints from uh, CMB only in gray, or including the short baseline uh, data on the physical mass of the sterile neutrino. And what we can see is that uh, if we assume uh, that the neutrino is around one electron volt of mass, an effective uh, must be much less than 4. So, again, if we expect to one on, uh, as a contribution from the sterile neutrino, it seems to be this far. Uh, if we 
if we consider also local uh, measurements of the of the matter fluctuations and on the Hubble parameter, we see that uh, there is now a preference for a massive neutrino, and the reason is just uh, due to the free streaming. So uh, the neutrino could uh, uh, help in uh, improving the compatibility between uh, the cosmological uh, estimates uh, uh, derived from the CMB and uh, the, the local measurements of sigma 8 and the Hubble parameter. Uh, the problem is that an effective must be much smaller than 1 for the sterile neutrino. So, uh, this is the value that is uh, calculated from the parameters of the oscillations derived uh, from the short baseline uh, anomalies. Uh, if we observe uh, something less than, uh, than one, assuming that the sterile neutrino exists, uh, we have to find some new mechanism that suppresses the thermalization and so the oscillations in the real universe, or some new mechanism in cosmology that prevents uh, the, the effects of an effective to be present. This is just a list uh, of uh, possible uh, uh, mechanisms that do the job. I want to show one of uh, oscillations in the early yeah. universe could be one way to thermalize them, right? Sorry? Oscillations in the yeah. early universe could uh, bring the extra neutrino into equilibrium. Yes. And contribute to this. In fact, the standard, if you do not assume uh, lepton uh, asymmetry or similar with the short baseline uh, parameters. Uh, for the mass and the mixing angles, you obtain that an effective equal to one, and that's ruled out. And that's ruled out, in fact. So, so how do you prevent that? I guess only you need a very small mixing. But if the mixing is very small, then you don't fit yes. the anomaly. So it doesn't uh, doesn't work. Interactions with uh, myron, perhaps. Yeah, interactions be. with the if, additional particles. Uh, if the mass comes from spontaneous. Uh, at least here, but uh, it's not. A what yeah. is the status of the new interactions? Because I thought yeah, there were some solutions. Ah, there, there, is, there, is there is a citation I wanted to in preparation with the yeah. So I want to know also in the same line that she was asking. Yeah. We are trying to. This is actually a model that has been studied in the past, and uh, we are studying uh, the possible interaction between the sterile neutrino and the pseudo scalar particle. In this case, part of the energy is uh, shifted from the active sector to the sterile sector during the evolution, but the pseudoscalar is massless, so you don't have uh, problems in constraining its mass, uh, and uh, basically you can allow, allow also uh, one electron volt or similar mass for the sterile neutrino, and uh, the fact that the energy splits uh, basically into the active and the sterile sector uh, makes you also can fit uh, a different uh, and effective because uh, this depends on the strength of the interaction, etc. So you have more freedom too. But I thought yes. there were other, I mean, for that was okay, but then uh, I kind of remember that there were papers saying that they could have other effects that are without. Mm, in, this case, in this case, not. <laughs> no. There is a also a possibility that you have, uh, instead of an uh, interaction between the sterile uh, and the pseudoscalar, if you have something like a vector interaction, in, the, in that yeah. case, yes, you have uh, effects also in the active sector and uh, you change uh, basically all the evolution also for the active neutrinos and this is uh, not very good, but... Uh, but you need an interaction strength which is not too weak? Uh, the interaction strength is, uh, yes. So it does but not fit with a, with a Goldstone boson picture? Uh, because if it is a Goldstone boson, you know the coupling. Yeah. It's the mass of the neutrino, and that's very tiny. Uh, well, the, now I don't remember the details of the model, but uh, I can... I think it has more. to be larger than, than, than that. I mean, the, the interaction has to be quite large. It's not yeah. effects that have to so be it yeah. does not fit in that sense. No, no, it doesn't fit in the marginal. No, again, it's not for the measure. Also, because the measuring is usually a massive particle. So no, no, it's massless. It's a massless it depends. Thing. It's a Goldstone boson. It depends okay. whether gravity breaks the global symmetry at some level or not. Okay. So, anyway, this is an analysis that uh, we started uh, one week ago. So. 
least some time. Uh, one mechanism in cosmology that can uh, instead uh, compensate for the effects of the, the additional uh, radiation is related to the inflation. Uh, inflation has been developed in the 80s uh, to explain uh, mainly the, the problem of the flatness uh, and uh, of the homogeneity of the universe. And uh, one common paradigm is to is uh, describing inflation through a scalar particle, scalar field that is called the inflaton, and uh, its uh, potential energy here. The, the shape of the potential uh, basically rules uh, the end of the inflation, and at the end of inflation, uh, the spectrum of initial perturbation is uh, produced. So the density of the inflaton is converted into energy densities that will evolve uh, through, the, uh, through the, the universe evolution and to generate the CMB, the matter perturbation, etc. The spectrum of this initial perturbation is usually described as a power law with a constant uh, tilt, but actually the tilt can be obtained by the derivatives of the potential, so this might be not constant. And the question is, if it's not constant, should we have uh, effects uh, on the analysis or not? Uh, here there are just three examples of uh, models that give uh, a non-constant uh, uh, NS. So you have uh, not a power law for the primordial perturbations, but uh, wiggles, uh, features, etc. Uh, this is not exotic in the sense that uh, the feature in the CMB spectrum that I show you at the beginning is uh, usually uh, related to inflation because you don't have any mechanism that can suppress one specific scale in the CMB spectrum outside the horizon at the time of the CMB decoupling. So you assume that the initial spectrum uh, was resp is responsible of this uh, deep and uh, if you try to reconstruct the spectrum, you see that there is actually this, uh, this shape. So, uh, assuming uh, a parametric uh, description for the primordial power spectrum, we want to study if uh, it is possible to uh, have uh, influences on the constraints. So, if uh, the CMB analysis are influenced by the freedom in the initial power spectrum. To study this, we assume uh, a list of uh, 12 nodes uh, and we interpolate the power spectrum uh, between uh, the nodes uh, using uh, this uh, interpolating function that is uh, um, substantially similar to a spline, but uh, the spline may have uh, some fluctuation that, that we want to avoid. So we decided to use this one that instead uh, is much more stable uh, against the, the fluctuations of the series of nodes. And uh, using this, we compare the results uh, for the sterile neutrino. Here I have uh, the case uh, with the standard power spectrum, and this is the case with the, the new, the free power spectrum. As you can see, if in this case uh, an effective equal to 4, so the contribution equal to 1 for the sterile neutrino, is uh, not ruled out but not favored, in the, in the case of the, the free power spectrum, the, the constraint changes a lot. And this is due to the fact that you can shift just the small scales of the power spectrum without altering the large scales, and you compensate the silk dumping due to the increased radiation. If you do the same and you consider a neutrino with the mass that can fit the short baseline data, the, the picture is rather different because the standard cosmology and effective is much uh, much smaller than uh, what we expect from uh, pure oscillations. With uh, a free power spectrum, instead it seems that it could work because uh, at least at 95% uh, uh, confidence level you have <coughs> compatibility. Uh, these results, however, are obtained with the old Planck data. If we go to the newer Planck data, so Planck, uh, 2015, uh, and we try to constrain and effective, uh, we have uh, different possibilities. So, with different combinations of uh, cosmological data and uh, standard power law, using only temperature data from the Planck experiment, 
we obtain that uh, n effective is close to 3. If we uh, relax the, the assumptions on the power spectrum, we see that uh, n effective can be also very large because, uh, again, the sieve dumping can be compensated by the variations in the power spectrum. But this is no more true if you consider also the polarization data, because the effects of the power spectrum and of the additional neutrino on the temperature and on the polarization spectra are different. So the degeneracies are broken, and you obtain results that basically are insensitive of the, on the number of nodes that you obtain, because you compare here a model where we assume the less nodes for the, the power spectrum. It's also possible to do this with more than uh, 12 nodes, but basically it's the same. So, if you consider polarization, <coughs> these mechanisms cannot explain uh, the, the discrepancy between the expected value of the, that an effective equal to 1 and the, the obtained constraints. Uh, Meanwhile, you can obtain constraints on the power spectrum, and so here you see the, the case of 12 nodes, and here the case of 8 nodes. The deep uh, corresponding to the CMB spectrum at L equal to 20, 20, 30, or what it is, can be seen only if you have uh, a sufficient number of nodes, or in particular if you have a node in the, in the precise position of this uh, deep. But the general behavior is substantially the same, and there is a, a wide range of uh, multiples in which the, the power spectrum can be uh, approximated with the power law. Uh, I want now to show you uh, an additional uh, possibility that actually will not solve the problems for the sterile neutrino, but uh, for the other cosmological measurements. And in this possibility, we consider the, the fact that uh, dark energy and dark matter are the most abundant uh, fluids in the universe. And we don't know what uh, kind of uh, particle models can explain uh, both of them. But it's possible that there is an interaction between dark matter and dark energy, or between them uh, and other components. Actually, the interaction with the ordinary matter is ruled out by the observation because uh, you, you would expect some uh, gamma ray fluxes that you don't observe, for example. But uh, a non gravitational interaction between dark matter and dark ma energy is not forbidden by anything. So we assume that uh, the stress energy trends of conservation for dark matter and dark energy <coughs> is not uh, separated, but uh, there is a common term that uh, converts energy from dark matter to dark energy. And uh, this is the parameterization of the, the coupling that is uh, absolutely not related to any kind of models because uh, we are just uh, studying the effects uh, of uh, what it happens without caring about the particle models that uh, are behind uh, this. And uh, for uh, this particular choice, uh, you have to be careful uh, on the values of uh, W. And so we had to split uh, these uh, two, two models to avoid uh, mm, infinite uh, divergences in the integrals. This is also convenient because you can study the, separately the model in which dark matter decays into, into dark energy and the model in which dark energy decays into dark matter. So, uh, first result. As uh, we can expect, uh, if we uh, compare the number CDM with the two coupling models, uh, we discover that uh, if dark matter decays in dark energy, we have less dark matter today, and vice versa for the opposite model, we have more dark matter today. This also means that in, the, in this case, you have, less dark, you have more dark matter in the real universe, and this, in this other case, you have less dark matter in the real universe. And this, this has a consequence, uh, in particular, on the matter perturbations that are parameterized again through sigma 8, because in the model 1, where there is more dark matter in the early universe, the evolution of the perturbations is faster, so you enter the nonlinear regime much earlier, and you get that today you have a large amount of matter fluctuations at small scales. The opposite uh, appears for the model 2, in which uh, <coughs> instead you have uh, a slower growth of the perturbation, and you have less perturbations today. If you, if you study the Hubble parameter, instead you, look, you can see that uh, in the model 2, the fact that we are allowing uh, 
the equation of state of the, the dark energy to vary allows us to have a very large uh, range for the Hubble parameters. Uh, this is true if you consider CMB data only, but it's, uh, CMB is very poor in constraining uh, the late time evolution. So if you consider also supernova or uh, other uh, small redshift data, <coughs> you discover that uh, this is the, the actual picture. So basically, you can uh, explain both the higher values of uh, the Hubble parameter and the small values of uh, the matter fluctuations only in the, the second model, so when dark energy decays into dark matter. And in this case uh, you can constrain uh, both the coupling and the equation of state parameters and you discover that uh, the late time uh, observations uh, of supernova and baryonic acoustic oscillations and so allows you to constrain uh, strongly the, the equation of state uh, but also the, the coupling parameter uh, in some cases here. You mentioned dark energy decay to dark matter. Yes. What kind of lifetime you have in mind? Well, uh, we don't have... Uh, Longer uh, than the age of the universe, right? Yes, yes. We don't have actually a lifetime because uh, you don't have a model to calculate yes, the computer. Because the coupling is proportional to the Hubble parameter, so uh, there is not uh, a decay rate. It's only a parameter. Yes. yes. Uh, it's possible to study, and several people uh, did uh, for uh, specific models. And in that case, you have uh, yes, comparable with the life of the universe, or so even more. But do you have any anybody in mind for? Uh, I think in the last uh, Planck uh, release uh, there were uh, some uh, some analysis. Uh, uh, I don't remember if it is the paper number 14 uh, or similar, and they studied modified gravity and the coupling uh, of dark energy. And I think here there is something. <coughs> uh, okay. This is uh, good in explaining the sigma 8 and the Hubble parameter tensions, but actually for the sterile neutrino that nothing changes. If we consider a sterile neutrino, as we did before, in the three different models we see that the constraints are basically the same. So again, we have uh, an effective much smaller than 4, and so the problem is not solved. And okay, to conclude, uh, we have the CMB, and the lambda CDM model are uh, very precise and very in good agreement, but there are some uh, small tensions. Uh, sigma 8 uh, and Hubble parameter tensions uh, may be uh, due to some new physics, may be new to the, to the systematics that are not well counted, uh, it's uh, to, be, to be studied in the future. In the same way, actually, the, the the existence of the sterile neutrino is uh, yet not confirmed. We have this uh, evidence uh, around three sigma, but uh, dedicated experiments with, will uh, will work uh, in, the, in the future years. The sterile neutrino may help uh, in producing, uh, in reconciling the CMB estimates and the local measurements, but. There is the problem of the thermalization, so an effect is much smaller than what we expect with four neutrinos. And some new mechanism must be found. Uh, we studied this mechanism related to inflation, but actually it works uh, only if you do not consider polarization. And since uh, Planck measured polarizations, this is also no more working. And uh, instead, the coupling between dark matter and dark energy may solve the cosmological problems, but not the neutral problems. So, thank you for the attention. Questions? In the case of uh, coupled dark matter dark energy, you are, right? you are um, imposing a coupling among them which is proportional to the vacuum well, to the dark energy. Right? Yes. If you assume that the coupling is proportional to the dark matter uh, density, do you think that the neutrino bounds will be changed in that case? Mm, I don't know. It's, uh, 
I think not. I mean, it's, because... more, it's, it's way more controversial than Kaki. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's like the couple with the sense case. I mean, you will have other sort of issues. I mean, like, uh, right? I mean, you will change the, the dark matter velocity and such. So, I mean, yes, I don't know. Because there are some uh, studies of uh, cup, couple dark matter uh, that, uh, for example, decays into dark radiation, and in this case, uh, uh, you can uh, find that uh, the dark part of the dark matter fraction must be warm and stable, and part uh, the the cold part must be decaying. Uh, in this case, we are assuming that basically dark matter is cold and plus we have sterile neutrinos. So maybe it's possible that something changes, but I don't expect yeah. that it is not. Uh, I mean, if you change the shape of the of the of the coupling, chi uh, h, right? Yes, maybe and yes. Instead of rho b, rho m, because then you are changing the the growth equation for the dark matter. Yes. And then you can play a bit, right, with this growth equation for neutrinos and for this new coupling and such. Maybe. I mean, I it's just a, I never, I never checked, so yeah. I mean, it's just a thought. So. I don't know, I don't know. I mean, in principle, you could try to model this in terms of a quintessence model, for example, of dark energy and mix with some dark matter. To have some working model, it would be very nice, mm -hmm. because you can compute things mm -hmm. more using particle physics mm -hmm. stuff instead, yeah, to have a instead of just a parameter in the... Yeah. More questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, when, when, uh, for example, many times you're showing these different models, I mean, for the last case, the old case, and have you ever thought about doing like some test, uh, some goodness of test comparison of the models? Because you're showing the parameters, yes, right? yes. this is not how it fits the data. No, in no. fact, uh, uh, in one of these slides, uh, uh, yeah, I, I brought this sentence. Okay, what? So, not true is better, but uh, on a qualitative point of view, we never quantified this. Okay. You can uh, calculate, the, for example, the chi-square, but uh, the methods that are uh, used are not so reliable if you have a large number of parameters uh, or uh, something like uh, strange shapes uh, in, the, in the posterior distribution. So, this is a Monte Carlo market chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could use multi-nest to use. To yes. Use the variation you can uh, you can use uh, nested sampling uh, techniques, uh, and uh, in this case, you obtain uh, the Bayesian evidence and you compare the evidences, and you have the. Uh, but you know the numbers you tried, or you no? We never tried. Yes, uh, I tried, but I had the problems with the uh, segmentation faults in the codes. <laughs> 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 I mean, the problem, is, the problem with multi-nest, I think that. Was a working, I mean, a, a version of Cosmon C linked to multiness, but now they changed, right? It's not yeah. all anymore multiness or whatever because yeah, this yeah. guy In, is no longer more. It's not working anymore. No, no, actually, it's, it's, <laughs> so I mean, you kind of bother him like, look, I need this working. Yeah. Actually, now there is a, a, a new version, like, let's say, of multiness that is called uh, Polycord or something yeah. like this. Yeah. That uh, was uh, published uh, together with the last uh, Planck uh, results uh, okay. because they used uh, to calculate uh, all the stuff about inflation, yeah. and the evidence of the various models, uh, and yes. to. No, that's true because I think it's a very important missing point in cosmology yes, yes, yes. historically. And I have another question. This is a matter that this dark energy that decays into a matter of the opposite that changed the dark matter today, right? Because yes. we know CMB needs some amount of dark matter, and then today we have different amount because of decay appears and disappears. And uh, what about the, um, the local evidences we have for dark matter, for example, the galaxies or even the body simulations, that should tell something about the amount of dark matter today, right? Yes. And yes. together with SMB, it should balance the, do you have any idea what this uh, data? I think, okay, uh, for example, in this case, this is the range allowed for the the yeah, case probably. where dark matter decays into dark energy. So for sure, if you use the local determinations, uh, probably large part of this is ruled out. And the same appears for this. Maybe there is here too much dark matter. Yeah, but the point is that, uh, yes, the, the growth of the 
the perturbations is different because uh, here you have uh, dark matter energy density that depends on time in a non-trivial way. So if you have uh, much uh, less dark matter at the beginning, the, the growth of perturbations is lower. So you should have a full end body simulation to, to study what it happens. <laughs> and there are people who have uh, explored these models for to explain the, the missing satellite problem. Mm -hmm. You have uh, people who have thought about this as a possible explanation mm -hmm. for the missing satellite problem to have some sort of interaction or even some clustering in that So we are. I think that uh, in the future this uh, Ricardo Murgia will work uh, on this because uh, he is now in Trieste working with uh, Matteo Viel uh, mm -hmm. and they will probably, if they will find time and okay. strategies, they will, uh, will test this. Thank you. Okay, if no more questions, we really thank uh, Stefano for a very nice talk.